Africa is a land with endless stories to tell. From epic battles, brilliant rulers, and the dramatic rise and fall of civilizations, join us on the History of Africa podcast to learn the oft-ignored stories of the African continent. From the sands of Cairo to the plains of Zimbabwe, and from the mountains of Ethiopia to the forests of the Congo, find the History of Africa podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Kia ora, g'day and welcome to the history of Aotearoa, New Zealand. Episode 80, Board Games. This podcast is supported by our amazing patrons, such as Chris. If you want to support Hans, go to patreon.com slash history Aotearoa. Last time, we talked about Māori games that required your brain to be good rather than your muscles. Today is going to be a bit of a shorter episode because I wanted to dedicate some focus to one game in particular. Throughout this topic we have discussed a range of games, but the one thing we haven't talked about, and possibly what you've been wanting to know, is did Māori play any board games? I'm a huge board game fanatic, so things like the Royal Game of Ur and Hnefeltafel, games from Mesopotamia and the Viking era respectively, are a really nice intersection of my interests. So naturally, when looking into this topic, board games is something I wanted to investigate, and find out whether Māori had any board games of their own. The short answer is yes, Māori had three board games that we know of, or at least that I could find information on. Well, In saying that, the first of these games may not be considered a board game in the technical sense, given it doesn't actually have a board. It was essentially a Māori version of Knuckle Bones, though Best calls it Jackstones. To Māori it was known as Koruru, and seems to have been played in roughly the same way to the Knuckle Bones games that most of you probably know, the main difference being no actual Knuckle Bones were involved, since there aren't really any native animals in Aotearoa with, well, you know, knuckles. So instead, they used pebbles. The idea was to take a pebble in one hand, throw it up, and then catch it in the same hand. While it was in the air, you also had to pick up another pebble. Then you would throw those two pebbles in the air, and pick up a third, and catch them, and so on. Again, all done with the same hand, and was done up to 15 pebbles. Which is... Kinda insane, that is a lot of pebbles to be catching in one hand. Another version of the game was played using only five stones. One stone was repeatedly thrown and caught, and while it was in the air, the other four stones would be moved into a central circle. Once all four stones were in there, the fifth stone would be thrown, and the four others picked up, with the fifth being caught. The phase would then be repeated, and all five stones thrown up into the air and tried to be caught on the back of the hand, with any falling off having to be picked up while a pebble is thrown. The final phase follows the same route as standard knuckle bones. Different iwi had different order of operations for this game, but by and large it seems to have been the same with a couple of added phases. The other two games were more quote-unquote true board games, in the sense that they had a board, so they fit the two requirements of being a board game. Kurupakara, or Minga Minga, is probably one of the oldest board games that Māori played. It could be played with a fairly large amount of players, each one playing as a different set of coloured rocks, which acted as a way to distinguish everyone's pieces, but also gave a nice effect on the board when the game was finished. This effect actually represented the celestial cloak of Rangi, as it is said the stars are a part of the cloak that the sky god wears. The board itself was made of woven harakeke and contained around 121 squares, or sometimes more, with 9 central squares, which were called minga. These squares were also differently coloured, in the same way a chessboard is. And in fact, similar techniques used to give different patterns in kākahu were used to make the board. In keeping with the theme of stars, the 9 central squares were meant to represent matariki, puanga and whānui, arguably the three most important constellations in Te Ao Māori. How the game was actually played differs depending on who you ask, as there were a few different variations on the rules. 
but in general, they mostly revolved around the grouping of same coloured stones on the board. One rule set had the players taking turns placing stones in an attempt to get them in a straight line outside the central squares. Once this was achieved, they would place one stone in one of the eight central squares that surrounded the ninth square. Initially, they would need to achieve a row of four stones before being able to place one in the central area. But after they achieved this, it would then ramp up to five before another could be placed in the centre, then six and so on, making the game gradually harder for those who were in front. Of course, as one player was trying to achieve this, other players were trying to deny them a line and create their own, as another rule said that on your turn you could pick up an opponent's stone, hand it back to them, and replace it with your own. The ultimate goal of the game was to have more of your stones in the central area than anyone else, at which point you win the game. The catch was that the ninth square in the very middle, the Putahi, could only be occupied when one player had placed so many stones in the central eight squares that it would be impossible for their opponents to individually get more pieces than them onto the other squares. In other words, you had to have a majority of the central eight occupied by your coloured stones. Once the putahi was occupied, the game ended and a winner declared. The only problem I see with these rules is that there doesn't seem to be any sort of catch-up mechanic. No source I read made mention of whether a stone could be removed from the central squares once it had been occupied. Such as if a player's already completed line is broken, would that mean they lose a square in the centre? That would make sense to me, otherwise it wouldn't really incentivise players to keep playing when someone was dominating the board, so it's possible that some rules were missing in the sources I read. Another version had the players trying to create squares of 9 stones in a 3x3 grid instead of a line, but otherwise play was the same. Sometimes, after someone had won, they would yell, Minya Minya, meaning the stars have filled the heavens. Minga Minga eventually kind of developed, or at least heavily inspired, this next board game, as it shares a lot of similar mechanics and continues with the constellation theme. Though this game also expands on this with the theme of a feke and its eight legs. Mutorere is a much smaller game played with only two people, and as such, the board is much smaller as well, consisting of a central node that is connected by radials to eight outer nodes in a circle. This is where the idea of the feki comes from in the game, and also how the theme of a constellation is continued, because that's kind of what it looks like. In particular, this constellation was usually Matariki. The rules are pretty straightforward and give the illusion of a much more simple game. But like all good board games, while the rules may be easy to learn, the depth of the game is much deeper. In fact, players who were very good at Mutorere could predict and plan up to 40 moves ahead. These two factors led to a few stories of Europeans being suckered in thinking they could beat Māori literally at their own game, only to have their ass handed to them, often losing a large wager in the process. The board of Mutorere was often a piece of bark from Tōtara. The various markings on the board would be cut when the bark was quote-unquote green, so that they became permanent when the bark dried. To stop the bark curling as it dried, sticks would be laid on either side and tied together. Later, planks would be used as boards instead. If for some reason a board wasn't available, the design could just be drawn into the ground. So, what are these deceptively simple rules? As mentioned, there are eight outer nodes, called kewai or kawai. These nodes are in a circle, and each player has a set of four same coloured stones to place on those nodes. At the start of the game, the stones are all placed next to each other on the nodes, so essentially each player controls one half of the board. The game then starts with one player moving a stone into the centre node, the putahi, freeing up the space it was just in. The opposing player can then move the stone adjacent to the free space to occupy it. 
play then continues where stones are moved in and out of the one free space on the board that is freed up each time a stone is moved. To move, your stone needs to be adjacent to the free space, whether that be because it is sitting next to the space on the outside nodes, or if it is in the central node, it is connected to all eight other nodes around the outside, so any stone can move in and out of the centre. The other key rule here is that for a stone to be able to move into the putahi, it needs to be adjacent to an opponent's stone as well. So for example, the first move of the game can't be to have one of the two inner pieces on your half of the board move into the putahi, because they are only next to your pieces, not the opponent's. So the only two conditions to make a legal move are, is your stone next to the free space, and is your stone next to an opponent's stone, if moving into the centre. Keeping in mind that for both of these conditions, the central stone is considered to be adjacent to every other space. The object of the game is to try and block your opponent from being able to make a legal move. If they are unable to make a move due to the centre space being occupied and the only outer space being blocked, you win. If my description of these rules are a bit confusing in the audio format, I have put up a video on my YouTube channel with me playing a game to show you how it works. Just search for History of Aotearoa New Zealand Podcast and you should find it pretty easily. Just look out for the green tuatara. One of the interesting things about the history of Mutorere, which many consider to be a pre-European game, is that Best thinks it may have only come about after Europeans arrived in Aotearoa. He mentions that the Hawaiian word for drafts, which is a European game, is mu or konani. So there is a resemblance there that may indicate a European influence on the creation of Mutorere. Additionally, he says that there isn't any evidence that links Mutorere to other islands in the Pacific, as they don't have similar games native to them, which is something that we would potentially expect if Mutorere came from Aotearoa via the Great Fleet. Best also goes even further to say that Mutorere was only known around East Cape on the North Island. Other iwi didn't have any knowledge of it. Again, we would expect other iwi to probably know of the game if it predated Europeans. It would make sense if some didn't know about it if it was much more recent. However, I would counter that these points don't necessarily mean that Mutorere is post-European, or of European influence. We have seen many unique aspects of Māori culture develop due to their relative isolation from the rest of the Pacific. So, I'm not sure that it would be that unusual for Māori to have a game that is specific to them and had no easily discernible lineage elsewhere in the Pacific. Communication in this time was also somewhat limited, so it isn't that unreasonable that if Mutorere originated, say, on the East Cape, that some iwi further away on the island, or deep in the bush, didn't know about it. Particularly if they weren't near the coast, or any major waterways where communication would be much easier via waka. It really does depend a bit on who Best was talking to when he says that others didn't know about it. Additionally, the crux of Best's argument is that Mutorere was heavily influenced by European drafts, or checkers if you're American. This doesn't really make sense though, since Mutorere doesn't have the squared checked board, something that we assume would be retained if it was inspired by drafts though that isn't certain to be fair. Plus, Māori already had a game with a board pretty much exactly like drafts or chess, so the concept of a checked board wasn't unusual to them. Then again, I may be talking out my ass here. As far as I can tell, we don't have a totally definitive answer on whether it was pre- or post-European. Even Māori that best talked to in his time gave conflicting answers, with some saying it was definitely pre-European, and others saying it was brought to Aotearoa by early whalers. It is also important to note that Best was doing his work in the early 20th century, so 
Although the information he got from his interviewees is useful, it had been about a hundred years since Europeans arrived, which is a long time for knowledge and stories to be influenced. In the modern day, Mutorere has had a few interesting evolutions and applications. There is a larger adaptation of the game designed to be played on a small court, using a person's body and feet rather than small stones. The game board slash court is set up in the same manner with rubber pads acting as the nodes, and played with two teams of two, resulting in a game that kinda looks like Twister. Mutorere is also apparently really popular at universities, as it has various applications in mathematics. Some games companies even sell the game as like an actual board game that you can just go out and buy. I wasn't able to find one of these copies, but the game is listed on Board Game Geek with pictures of the board in various styles, so that would indicate that it was sold at one point. My first encounter with the game though was actually before researching this topic and very much unintentional, and I initially didn't even realise it was a Māori game when I played it. The PC game Mount and Blade 2 Banner Lord has you roaming around as a medieval mercenary or lord, raising armies, fighting battles, and generally just being a feudal person. The fictitious land of Calradia has a number of factions inspired by real life cultures, those being the Celts, Romans, Mongols, Scandinavians, French, and Arabs. Each culture has a unique board game that can be played as a mini game and these are drawn from real historical games, such as the Roman faction having a version of the Scandinavian game, Hnefeltafel. As you can tell, the developers weren't super concerned about the games being historically relevant to their associated factions, given they gave the Scandinavian game to the Romans when there was already a Scandinavian faction. As such, when you go to a tavern or a castle in Vlandian territory, the French-inspired faction, you may just find a board game that you can play that is exactly the same as a game from the South Pacific. A game which goes by the name of Mutorere. Next time, we will talk about games for the tamariki, for the kids. So games that are more straightforward than what we have talked about thus far, and involved some back and forth between them. We will also discuss a bit about European interactions with Māori games when they arrived on the scene. If you want to send me feedback, ask a question, suggest a topic, or just have a chinwag, you can find my email and social media on historyaotearoa.com. Aotearoa spelt A-O-T-E-A. R O A. You can also find helpful resources there, like transcripts, sources, and translations for some of the Te Reo Māori we have used. You can help support Hans through Patreon, buying merch, or giving us a review. It means a lot and helps spread the story of Aotearoa New Zealand. As always, Hairi tu atu, hoki tu mai. See you next time. The other key rule here is that for a stone to be able to move into the putahi, it needs to be adjacent to an opponent's stone as well, if moving into the centre. If they are unable to make a move due to the centre space being occupied and the only outer space being blocked, you win.